Welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we do have a doctor in the house from time to time, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing we say on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check in with a trusted medical professional about your own personal medical concerns. Hello, and welcome to Keto Life Support. This is Kim Howerton, and this is episode number 129. And today, we get a treat. So there's this little show called MasterChef that's on TV, and there's this guy, Michael, Chef Michael, who is amazing and was in the running for the All-Stars recently. And he is on the podcast today. I talked to him just the other day, recording this little intro after the fact. I have to say, he is the sweetest, nicest, super talented. I, I am a fan. And if you aren't already, you will be by the end of this episode. I guarantee it. So sit tight and listen in to this really nice talk that Chef Michael and I were able to have. Enjoy. I'm super happy to have you, Michael. Michael, now I notice, are you a Michael or a Mike? That's all. I could go into a whole story. I, I'm going to shut my mouth early in this and give you a simple answer so we have time to talk about other stuff. But okay. my whole family calls me Mike or Mikey, but um, Michael feels more like my professional name. Yeah. All right. So, but all you right. can call me Mike. We're friends now. You can call me we're, Mike. We're friends. So, <laughs> I should tell you, my brother is a Michael. So, um, mm. and I'm the only one who calls him Mike. Everyone else calls him. So I, I can do, I can do Michael. This is Jeff Michael, people. I'm talking to Chef Michael, everyone who knows who Chef Michael is, but let's go into it. Chef Michael, who are you? Oh, gosh. It's um, a deep that, existential question. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. How deep are we going here today? Um, <laughs> you might know me from social media. You might know maybe one of my cookbooks. You might know me from a little TV show with Gordon Ramsay called Master Chef. But I am a keto chef and author and enthusiast who um, also kind of went through my own health journey with keto, personally speaking, having nothing to do. Actually, that happened long before any of this other exciting stuff happened. Lost uh, 83 pounds in a year on keto and have been keto now for over four years, living a sustainable lifestyle with it. And, and I, I love to share that and talk about that, especially with non-keto people. But yeah, that kind of sums it up in a nutshell. Chef, author and general lover of food. Got it. That's awesome. Yes, I remember I watched your first season of MasterChef because, uh, and your second, but I am, I'm a foodie. I actually can walk to Chez Panisse from my house, which is kind mm -hmm. of nuts. And then many people listening are like, what? Anyway, but if you're a foodie, <laughs> you know. Um, and that, would, that would get me in trouble for the record. <laughs> that would hurt no, my, you're... my belt and my bank. Yeah, yeah. It's a very nice restaurant, people, in case you don't know. Yeah. Um, but I guess better for my wallet and my waistline, I walk through the edible schoolyard, you know, Alice Waters project on my mm. daily walk. So it's it's nice. How fun. Um, I'm How bragging fun. now. But um, so I was also somebody who loved food, was super into food, big foodie, and then lost over 100 pounds when I went keto. So like, I feel you on the journey. Mm. And I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk about your cookbooks, but let's put those later because I want them to be kind of like a ta-da. <laughs> How did you get into cooking and food? Like, what was the love? Like, where did that come from? Um, you know, first of all, I've always loved to eat since I'm a kid. <laughs> I was not one of those kids that, that needed to be tricked into eating food. There's something about the food industry specifically that really captured me at a very young age. And on top of that, just seeing how important food was culturally in my family, in my life, I think it, it'd be ultimate universal sign of foreshadowing as a kid. My mom gathered all of our family recipes, grandmothers, aunts, uncles, whatever, put this together into a homemade cookbook for mm. our family to memorialize and kind of ensure that this, this, long lineage of cooking stayed in the family. And, you know, I think at a really young age without, I don't think this was my mom's intention, 
But it really showed me the power of food, the importance of food as a communicator, as a way to share love, as a way to share identity, culture. I mean, this it's all so deeply ingrained, I think, in so many cultures and so many families. Um, the food we eat is sort of the ultimate way of, of gathering and bringing people together. You know, when I think of holidays, I think of the food before anything else. So, you know, I think a lot of little micro moments in my childhood led me to getting my first job at 13 years old in an Italian restaurant. And I was fascinated. I mean, I fell in love. You know, I, I was begging. I wasn't even legally able to work. I didn't have a work permit. I was, too, I was too young. I was begging to work there. And we had no, we had begged the manager, like, you don't even really have to pay me much. Just, I just want to be in this restaurant. You know, I was hooked from a very, very mm -hmm. young age. That passion has not really stopped at any point. My relationship with working in restaurants, my relationship with food has changed over the years for many, many reasons, personally and professionally, as I, I found some unhealthy parts of my relationship with restaurants and food as well. So that, that's a bigger conversation, but food is my world. It probably always will be. I think it's interesting because in the keto world, there are definitely abstainers, right? I think and then moderators. Such, exactly. There's there's such mm -hmm. an interesting thing. And it's one of the things I was super excited to talk to you about that's kind of fascinating mm. to me is you live in what some people would think are two worlds, right? There's like keto and not keto, like a hard line. It's like you're either eating keto or you're not. And you're on a mainstream show, you're cooking, you know, non-keto food, you're still interacting with those worlds, but you're still in the keto world. Does that feel dichotomous? Does that feel too, or how do you bridge that? Yeah, I just saw on my Zoom screen, you made me bite my nails with this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I guess that kind of reveals that the inner... Uh, turmoil tumultuousness yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Of, of this conversation of this point you're bringing up it's complicated um yeah. my god um it's complicated for me personally it's frustrating for me professionally you know it is dichotomous you have as a chef i see my job as to make delicious food for my customers mm -hmm. right that is the job of a chef and in certain platforms with my food and my writing and, and my business as Chef Michael, my customers want and appreciate and value that keto food. In other spaces, I cannot say the same thing. Um, I have confronted many a times, not just with, with mainstream television, but even with press and other work that I've done on radio and television that some people just don't want to talk about keto. And I don't know that I always blame them for that because I think keto has unfortunately uh, become or or has been for some time a very taboo subject and a very controversial diet. I'm using air quotes right now if right. you're listening to this. Um, it's become a very controversial diet, which is silly to me because it's really not that controversial. We're cutting out sugar and, and pasta. It's, not, it's right. not that serious. But, you know, people see it as this this dangerous thing. Metabolic we're ourselves and our, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Our, our brains are going to melt off of our right. skull. Right. Um, it's complicated for me. Yeah, it's definitely complicated because I feel so personally, uh, you know, on such a mission to share not only my food, but sort of the way that this this type of food has made me feel, forget about weight loss, the way it's made me feel. That, that's why I only tried to lose weight for one year. The next three years of keto for me have been, you know, I, I guess maintenance is one word. For me, it's it's a lifestyle of keto. You're just living um, a life, right? Just live it. And I probably will forever. I don't yeah. plan to ever stop. That doesn't mean that, you know, if I'm, you know, traveling on vacation or if I'm in Mexico City and, and again as a chef, I want to explore the world as food, you know, I, I give myself that freedom and and lose all shame around that when I'm not eating keto food. And that's done, that's been done through a lot of self-work and, and acceptance yeah. and therapy yeah. and other things. But yeah, it's it's a tricky subject as a chef. Um not everybody wants to, to talk here or eat anything with the K word in front of it. <laughs> I um, know. It's interesting though, because actually like I think it is, you know, speaking back to the food culture I grew up in. So, you know, the, the fact that I was almost 300 pounds is a little crazy because like California cuisine, right? Like the carbs are actually a pretty minor part. It's much mm -hmm. like if I go to a fancy restaurant, I'll often end up with a very small amount of something starchy and a lot of meat and, and vegetables mm -hmm. in it. And that's like 
that's the fancy meal because mm-hmm. at a expensive restaurant, they're going to give you the quality stuff. It's the cheap sure. restaurant where they're loading you up on the starch and the pasta and the bread. And, 100%. The, and if you go to Italy, I mean, people always think pastas, but it's like, it's a small part of what you're eating. And oh, it's only one course. Yeah. Right. It's only one course. Yeah. You're not eating yeah, 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 like yeah. a bowl of pasta the size of your head. No, the um, pasta is not the entree in Italy right, at all. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and, so, and actually to, to your point, even further, yeah, like very, yeah. very high end cuisine is like, I constantly, fo- you know, I follow these like Michelin star chefs yeah. and restaurants and it's so funny to me. They serve course after course. And I'm like, that's keto. That's keto. That's keto. <laughs> and again, that's because nobody's thinking about it that way. It's just really right. hot cuisine. It's just really, you know, really beautiful food with, you know, a little bit of veggie and a little, you know, a beautiful right. piece of meat, but you're so right. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah. And well, technically, I mean, certainly if I went to like the French laundry, right, I'm sure at the end of the meal, I'd add up the carbs and be like, well, that was not really keto. But the majority of the calories would certainly be coming from the fat and the protein, not the carbs. Yeah. So how do you think, and I'm in the same boat where I'm like, if I want to, I like to go places and test things out. And Mm -hmm. so when I go out to eat, I'm like, you know, I'm going to try that. I'm going to have that, but I'm not going to have it all, or I'm going to have a bite of it, or I'm going to, um, but I also had to go through a really strict period where I didn't like deviate. Did you have an experience yeah. like that? Hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think everybody's journey is so different. Discovering our our purpose and why we're doing keto is a really fundamental start of a journey in health. And you know, for me, weight loss was a part of it, but I also needed to regain control of my eating binge eating and emotional eating was my world with a very stressful lifestyle. Food was my source of comfort and it was my escape. And so creating a healthy relationship with the food, not just because it's keto, but because I'm developing a healthy understanding of um, of how and why I'm eating right now, but also simultaneously getting rid of the shame around food yeah. was a big part of the work I had to do within myself. And to kind of kick that addiction of sugar and carbs to me required a certain amount of like cold turkey approach. I think everybody's so different and I'm not like a coach or a nutritionist sure. or anything. I don't have a, a, a knowledge base to guide yeah, But your personal with, experience is super valuable. My, my, yeah. yeah. Anecdotally, you know, I had to step away from carbs fairly strictly for several months just to get rid of the addictive part of it. And I think most people who try keto and I hate the word fail, but they say that. I'm not saying that about people who've fallen off. But, you know, for people who start keto and don't find long-term success on it, I think that there's a they cut out the food but relied solely on kind of forcing it, for, you know, and and didn't work on the other parts of why we're eating those carbs, which again comes down to a lot of self-work, mental health, honest conversations, struggle the expectation of perfection has to go away. Like, you know, actually I saw the totally off topic, but I saw an interesting video today of a woman talking about this bowl of dried strawberries and talking about how, you know, she saw a a health coach saying to somebody, Oh, if you're craving potato chips, eat this bowl of freeze dried strawberries. And she had a really interesting perspective. She said, I say, don't do this because nobody on earth, is craving potato chips and that craving will be solved by this bowl of strawberries. In fact, you'll eat 10 times the calories and then still be craving the chips. Go eat the chips (laughs) so that you can work on that craving and then continue the next day where you left off. Get rid of the shame, get rid of the, like this, like policing of your food and find a way to really, um, develop healthy relationships with your eating. And so I don't know. I mean, that, that's kind of in contrast to what I'm saying. There, well, there's a lot it. of ways to go about it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I get okay. into this a lot. Like a lot of my recipes, I don't do a ton of like, oh, this is a keto pasta or a keto pizza. I try to develop recipes that are just their own. They're not trying to be a carb item. They're just a real food. I don't know if that makes any sense, but sure, you're get, not copycatting. You're you're saying like, how do right. I and how do I express this food in its best right. form? 
Right. But occasionally I do, you know, I love some of the things that I've come up with around like mashed potatoes and stuff like that. But I generally find that like, you're not tricking anybody. That cauliflower mash is not but it's maybe you could celebrate it as the best cauliflower <laughs> mash that you like and call it what it is, you know? Sure. But I personally yeah. would rather, and we could debate this because I sure. personally would just rather a beautiful roasted cauliflower with spices and stuff than trying to pretend I'm eating mashed potatoes. Right. I'd rather just make the best damn cauliflower ever that has nothing to do with mashed potatoes and feel really satisfied by that rather than pretending I'm eating mashed potatoes that are just not going to hit the same way. But that's a that's a personal choice, and that's my own approach to food. But we're all over the place right now. But yes, I, sorry, I do this think is a, that... this is my pod. This my podcast is almost always all over the place. So you're okay, doing good, it good. perfectly good. right. I, yeah, and this this conversation gets me all hyped up because it's it is an important one, and I I think the most important thing that I want to leave you, the answer to your question with is like figure out what works for you, yeah. and if that's if that's taking a month, two months, three months, completely away from carbs, then that's a great approach. I do think for a lot of people, especially early in keto, that you got to step back from it. I think even the, the alternative sweeteners can still be triggering in those first few weeks, which are the hardest. People message me. I talk to people all the time. I'm two weeks in, I am struggling. And I'm like, please keep going. You get through. It's like when you're in turbulence in the airplane and it seems, but then all of a sudden something happens and it's like smooth flying from there. Did you find that? Cause I definitely have found yeah, that. Yeah. I, I had to employ a lot of strategies cause I also mm. identify as a food addict in mm. terms of like, I'm coming into keto. I was used to eating whenever I wanted, right? Like eating whenever the feeling struck me that I wanted to eat and going keto. I was like, all right, I'm doing this in like AA. They'll say like, I didn't know I had another sober in me. Right. I don't know if you've ever heard mm. that expression. No. So it's like, you always know you have another drunk, but you don't know if you have another sober, you can always fall off the wagon, but you don't know if you can get back on. And I had reached a place in my journey where I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get on again if I fall off. So I was like, this is life or death and I've got to do it. I have to say I carried around an iced coffee with heavy cream in it. Like I was a baby with a sippy cup for like the first two weeks because anytime I wanted food, I'd be like, I'm having some iced coffee with my little heavy cream here. Mm -hmm. Like I needed something to like, just keep me, keep my blinders on. And so I think, I think it is really important because I think that you stay the course for a while because if you're like seven days in, I had this thing. And then four days later, I had this other thing. It's like, what are you doing then? You never get the experience of pushing through. There's an expression in, in social psychology. I don't know if you've ever heard of it called the breakers, right? Have you ever jumped in the ocean or like been in the ocean, sure. been around the ocean, right? There's this place between shore and something called the breakers, which is where the waves break, right? Where if you are trying to swim in that region in a really like in a place with a lot of surf, you are going to die. You're just getting churned up and tossed back on shore and hitting your head against a rock. But if mm. you can keep going until you get deep enough that you're past the breakers, the water is smooth. You got to keep going until you're past the breakers because 100%. before then you're going to get killed. Yeah, no, 100%. And there's so much, you know, I'm, I'm even glad you brought up AA. I, I don't know a lot about it particularly, but I definitely have come to understand over the past few years, the addictive power of food. And yeah. one of those realizations for me, much like a recovering addict, is that it is a lifelong battle, right? Like I'm not healed. I'm not magically enlightened around food, you know? And and so- Never again do I, I want to have an extra thing. Yeah. No, no. no. I still catch myself when I'm stressed or uh, under the influence after a few drinks or making bad decisions. I still, you know, will will have a really bad night where I just, you know, uh, really mess up or whatever. And one of the things that has come through years of, of work for me is that one bad meal is not going to eliminate four years of progress that I've done on my body and my health. And 
oh, it, it can only do it to your brain if you let it, right? Right, right. And and so interestingly, my relationship to keto and, and eating is so different now than that first year because of exactly what you're saying. Not because now I'm somehow so much, uh, I've altered my metabolism in such a way or whatever that I can handle more carbs. No, the difference is that now I can treat myself to some butter chicken with rice and not think twice about it. And literally the next morning, I'm just back to to eating, totally. you know, fully low carb. It doesn't bring me down. It doesn't uh, send me into a spiral of, oh my God, now I've had some white rice. Well, now I can have the entire box of Oreos and I'm going to go to the gas station and get ice cream and Sour Patch Kids, right? Like that's where I used to be, but I've come to understand that a little bit of carbs, especially, you know, focusing on staying kind of in my, my focus around real food. Like I'm not going to feel shamed for eating sushi once in a while with the rice, that is to me, it's a very different thing than me sitting on my couch with, you know, uh, an entire box of Cheez-Its. It's a completely totally. different story, but that did not happen in month one or really even year one. My year of weight loss was highly targeted, highly focused, and really, um, really taken very seriously. And so I think again, that understanding what it is what it is you want out of keto what it is that you're looking for from your keto or or any health journey you, you could be listening right now as a vegan what right. what do you want out of it right. you don't have to be a vegan to lose weight you don't have to be keto to lose weight you can do it for other reasons you could do it for gut health you could do it for PCOS you could do it for epilepsy you could do it for whatever and then kind of work around that you know if it is for weight loss which is fine and it can be very successful it does take sort of tweaking what keto might look like for you. Does that mean you're tracking in an app everything that you're eating? Possibly. Does that for mean for a lot of people? Included? Yes, but yeah, yeah, for a lot of people, yeah, could it be? Sure. Um, but for me, now that I am going to be keto for 20, 30, 40 more years, I'm not going to sit here typing every meal into an app for the rest of my life. And nor do I think that's particularly feasible for anybody. So yeah, 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 yeah. I think just just finding your finding your reason and focusing in on that and figuring out what works for you. <laughs> there are some people who carb cycle who can, you know, on Sundays eat whatever they want. They don't think twice. They're fine with it. And there might be medical reasons why that works for them. There's other people where having a carb day could be absolute disaster. And just being honest with yourself about what that is for you, I think is is probably a, a really nice place to to start when you're thinking about this stuff. Right. And I think for me, like, I don't know if you felt this, but like for me, I think, I mean, I certainly tried diets in the past and things, but keto was the first time that putting some kind of restriction on myself. I mean, once I got past the panic, of a food addict getting her drug of choice taken away. It was the first time I was able to like put up restrictions on my eating that still felt good, like felt sane, didn't feel punishing. I don't know how to explain it yeah. exactly, but I was like, oh, oh I'm 100%. getting to eat good food here. It's where I learned everything about how my body works instead of fighting with it. A million percent, a million percent. Yeah. I've done other diets without question for me, keto felt the most undiety yeah, yeah, at, yeah. At, a, at a really sort of simple level because we can still really eat you know um I, I think certainly one could make an argument about you know calorie in calorie out when we're talking about weight loss and that's a different discussion but keto food can be very satisfying very very satisfying very filling very yummy right you know kind of kind of comforting you know real food not a little dainty lean cuisine from the microwave, you know, it can be, it can be real food. And I do think that helped. And, and I'm just the kind of person where I don't do well when I'm being forced to do things in my life that I don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, keto for me allowed me to still eat most of the foods that I loved and not feel like I'm under some jail cell of rules right. and restrictions I think that's why it does work well. For I don't think it would have stuck if that wasn't the thing. No, no. Yeah. But there's also ways, even within that, you could, you know, you can you still can mess go it up. overboard. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can definitely go overboard. And I have, you know? Yeah. I have, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that I want to go back to this about sweeteners. Mm. That some people find sweeteners challenging because they 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 amp up that craving. Where do you stand? I mean, talk to me more about what do you think sweetener use looks like sanely, if any? You're like, that's a big um, question. <laughs> well, and and again, it's changed for me. Yeah. Um, and I think it probably should change for people as they go through these explorations of, of how they're eating. In the beginning keto desserts and keto friendly treats that I would make for myself were pivotal in me staying on track in that first year. Really important, you know, just to kind of ease my way off of sugar as a, as a high, though I didn't know that's what it was then I recognize it now, but it is still a sweet and it still makes me want more sweet in a very yeah. simple form, you know, um, a keto brownie, my keto brownie. I love it. It's, I truly believe, I mean, every, probably every recipe developer thinks their recipes are the, the best, best version of it or whatever. Cause they are, um, I mean, for your yeah, palate. It's like Absolutely. every parent, every parent thinks their kid is the best, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so, so I, I really love my brownie recipe. I make it maybe twice a year just because then I want it the next day. And it's still very caloric. And it still just gets me wanting more and more and more. So I try to stay a little bit away from sweets, even the keto ones, especially the packaged ones, yeah. just for me and, and what's worked for my my body, my gut, and my, my mental relationship with food. I feel like that mental um, part is yeah. so important. Like mm. you eat the sweet thing, what does your brain do? Does it say, please more? Or is it like, oh, that was good. I feel so-. like, I think there are different people with different responses. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. You know, um, it's important to have an out, you know, a, an emergency escape. <laughs> right? And, um, you know, I think that if you're in that turbulence and you're in that plane and you're really panicking, uh, you're really craving that brownie and, and they have an you option. Know, if, it, if the option is, is my keto recipe or, going to the grocery store and getting a birthday cake. Because you know you won't and, stop at the, you know, you'll eat the whole birthday cake, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So so yeah. I think having having an emergency escape is great. And I would rather certainly somebody eat, you know, a keto yeah. brownie than a regular one if it's possible. But I think no brownie is still better than a keto brownie. Good, good point. <laughs> so, okay, I have, a, yeah. I have a more chef-y kind of question about mm. sweeteners. What sweeteners do you like and what sweeteners don't you like from a baking perspective? So baking, savory, sweet, it doesn't really matter. I yeah. I feel like somebody, whoever's making all the allulose in this country should be paying me. I am a diehard allulose yeah. um, a user, abuser. I don't know what you want to say, both for taste and for for culinary reasons. It just works the best for me in the kitchen. It's very consistent it behaves the most like sugar chemically speaking when I'm developing recipes, but it's not a perfect solution for a few reasons. Yeah. It's very expensive. Very. And that hurts me knowing that that creates a barrier for some people who yeah. want to cook my food. Uh, it's also pretty much only available in the United States. Again, yeah. that is a problem when I have people buying my books or going to my blog from, from different countries. So I battle with this constantly. Um, just yesterday, I was working on a dessert recipe that I'm going to put on socials for pumpkin donuts. And they're delicious. Mm -hmm. They're so cute. They're really yummy, little mini pumpkin donuts with the glaze. And I have all the sweeteners in my house and I was desperately hoping to be able to use a different sweetener for the glaze. And I tested it and tested it. And if I could get the erythritol to look right and, and drizzle right, it just, it was not edible anymore. And then if I did it and I, I just. Uh, yeah, you can, cause you can make, and this is, you know, this is the tricky part with a lot of recipe creators, right? You can make erythritol glaze look, look delicious. It looks perfect. And you take a bite and mm -hmm. you're like, is this made of sand? I think this mm -hmm. is made of sand. Yeah. It's so good. Uh, I, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but 
the blogger community is tough. I mean, it's a tough lifestyle uh, to do yeah. what I do and, and I don't mm-hmm. blame anybody, but I'll just say this. This isn't about anybody else. This is about me. I will not put out a recipe that I'm not proud of. Yeah. I don't care if it, it takes a great photo. <laughs> like if it doesn't taste right, I'm not going to put it out. And I made an erythritol glaze that looked perfect. It looked great, yeah. but it, it was inedible. I literally, it was inedible and I, I can't do that. So I, uh, this is tricky for me. And then, you know, I write a recipe based on allulose and then I inevitably get a bunch of people. Can I who, use? <laughs> can I use? I can't find that. It's, you know, and the short answer is like, not really. I mean, you could certainly try it, but it's not, you know, it's not going to work. There's yeah. such a chemical difference. That being said, I hope for the day when allulose is more readily available overseas and is um is more readily readily available in terms of cost it's yeah. it's not it's just yeah. not super accessible right now but i swear by it personally okay. as a chef okay. i know it can vary but you you sound like you spend a lot of time on each recipe how long would you say it takes you to really perfect a recipe one that hmm. you really care about i know it's going to really vary it definitely varies you know i'll put it in two categories savory yeah. and sweet Sweet probably takes five to 10 times longer for me. First of all, I'm very picky and it's just baking is, is a frustrating art form because you can't adjust as you're going, you know, it's not like I'm making a saute or whatever, and I can just like try a little more of this or a little more of that. And then the recipe, I have to see the process through and then start all over again. So baking's tough for me. I'm a pretty decent baker with non-keto things and you'll see it on TV. Like I've won many a baking competition. Yeah, you're, um, was it the, the the chocolate cake? Those were like out of this world, oh, right? Oh, the hazelnut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually, in both seasons of MasterChef, I won multiple um, baking challenges. I'm a pretty good baker, but the keto baking is- A whole new animal. Is a whole new game. And uh, I got some really good advice from uh, Carolyn Ketchum, the food dreamer, who's a great recipe developer and uh, has a whole library of keto baking books. And she basically said, I talked to her about this early in my recipe development career. And I said, I'm really struggling with this. And she said, Michael, you got to let go of everything Mm -hmm. you've classically been taught about baking. Stop trying to keto-fy the same recipes and processes and rethink it completely. It was a very simple piece of advice that really profoundly changed my approach to keto baking, which was you can't just take a regular cake recipe and try to keto it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You really just have to rethink the whole thing and rethink the science and the chemistry behind all of it and not try to just swap out sweeteners and, and flowers from a a regular pie crust recipe or whatever sounds obvious now saying it out loud, but three years ago when I was trying this new journey. Okay. So baking super hard, super long. I would say in my cook, all my cookbooks have a dessert chapter. The dessert chapter takes as long for me as the rest of the book combined. Whole book. Okay. Yeah. The the rest of the book combined. So, you you know, we're looking at five X easily five, six X as long for me, which, which could be a couple days. Savory dishes typically, Sometimes I nail it on the first time um, and I'm like, this is it. I don't need to change a thing. I'll Done. test it once more, but I'm like, yes, this is so good. Wrap it up, you know, and <laughs> you know, then I just start typing it out. So savory food is so much more my love language in yeah. the kitchen. Yeah. And so um, I find it much easier to just have fun with it. But and, it's and- amazing as a recipe creator, right? How many more hits sometimes the sweet recipes get. I know, but I know, or, you, but or do you not I, uh, find that? Do you find that that's not true for you? No, I would say generally speaking, a, a dessert post on Instagram or whatever will will generally do well. And savory is sort of unpredictable. But yeah. I think why I hesitated to agree to that is because I just don't really give a shit. <laughs> 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 awesome. I I do not You're and not will in it not for the likes. I will not be a slave to these algorithms. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> It's just not going to happen. And also, you know, back to what I said earlier, I I think people need real food. If it gets a thousand likes, whatever, that's, I don't, that's not what gets me up and doing this every day. And I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's honestly kind of just like where I'm at. Like, yeah, I just, it's, I'm not going to like make crap just 
to get likes and follows. Um, I, I really want to connect and help people. Yeah. So yeah, real food as much as possible. You'll see, I'll do maybe a dessert a month. And I really focus on the desserts in my cookbooks being absolutely phenomenal. Even if there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, they are phenomenal. They're the best of those, the best pound cake, the best brownies, because to me, that's the ultimate reward for supporting my work and getting a cookbook is like, you have the best brownie recipe you'll find in the keto space. And I, I kind of like feel very proud of that. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I occasionally throw in a dessert, especially for holidays. I do sure. throw in dessert. Speaking of holidays, they are approaching mm. in this world. Now, I don't know. I am a Hanukkah, Christmas celebrate, like, bowl. I'm a, my family d- does both. My Jewish Christ- mother. Christmas, loves Christmas Kwanzaa or whatever. More than, my mother is a decorator. She's an interior designer. Mm. So she's more of a holiday decorator than she is mm. a holiday. I'm the cook. She's the dad. Anyway, so Hanukkah does not have as many decorating opportunities as Christmas, really. So she's into Christmas from a aesthetic perspective. But uh, we kind of do a little of both. What do you celebrate? And are there recipes that are really meaningful to you this time of year? I love this question. It made me smile. Yes. So I also, I grew up in a Jewish household and again, food is kind of the whole thing, right? I feel like Jewish families, Italian families, Nigerian families. like We're all about the food. Right, right. Like the, the holiday is kind of an afterthought. It's it's yeah. really the food. But then for those decorators, I get that too. Um, Fabulous you know, opportunity for glitzy things. Absolutely. Um <laughs> Food that's meaningful to me around the holidays. My mom's latkes at Hanukkah are are definitely a comfort food for me. I did make a keto ish version using celery root that I have in my holiday. I have a little holiday ebook. They're really good. Like they're really really good. Celery root is a great alternative to potato. I wouldn't call it extraordinarily keto. It's about fifty percent the, the carb size. Yeah, yeah, but it's a great way to go into the holidays without <laughs> going yeah, yeah. Um, i have to tell you no this is so funny i last year not to interrupt you remember where you were going no, go. um i tried every root vegetable latka mm. so i did spaghetti squash i did celeriac mm-hmm. i did parsnip i didn't do parsnip because that's too high i did turnip i did mm. rutabaga all the root vegetables i did them all even, oh gosh, now I've forgotten what that's called. Kohlrabi, which I thought mm-hmm. would be a winner, but it's too absorbent. And I agree with you. Celery root celeriac came out the best of all those choices. So I, I just want to say your instinct yeah. was correct. Awesome. I've tried, I've done them all. And there's a couple yeah. of times where that, that isn't true. I did, uh, I think it's in my second book. I have like a, a potato gratin baked, you know, cheesy I use, gratin. I use and I think it was the kohlrabi. Yes. Okay. <laughs> kohlrabi. There we go. See, see, we're, we we're know, finding we know. the same results. Yeah. The celery root didn't quite work there, but the celery root mashed potatoes from my first book are by far the, the you can serve them to anybody. They will not know they're not potato. Genuinely, you would not know they're not potato. Um, and for half the carbs, I think that's a win, but I do I also make, and it's not, you know, again, depends on how people see it, but I make stuffing every year just using like a Sola, you know, type of keto Uh bread, uh um, which generally I don't keep too much of that stuff in my house just because I just don't need to do that. But it's really good. (laughs) It's really good. I I saute, you know, sausage, breakfast sausage, and, you know, really load it up. But, um, I love my low carb stuffing and it's just, you know, it's classic. It's nothing, nothing particularly innovative about it. I don't think you need to innovate in the holidays. I know holidays some is about to, tradition. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of a traditionalist in that sense. So, yeah. you know, Thanksgiving, you know, I want the stuffing and stuff like that um, and mashed potatoes. And I have found alternatives. Are they like absolutely low carb? I guess that depends on what you're looking for. I think, you know, especially through the holidays, if people can just not go overboard, they've won. Totally. So, <laughs> and and if you want to have one of your grandma's cookies, have one. Just don't eat the whole tray, but have have one. You know, celebrate life and live life. But it's these types of alternatives that make that make great, great, great solutions. Yeah, I think that's 
awesome. I love the latka and the stuffing. Uh, stuffing is also one of my favorite foods. So, and it's yeah, bad stuffing 100%. is so disappointing. So you gotta get. I know. Food. I'm like, I if it, if the bread doesn't work, I'd rather leave it out. Right? Like you gotta you gotta Absolutely. do this thing. And there's tricks, like if you're going to use the keto bread for stuffing, and actually you should do this with any bread, but I leave it out. I you lay out like slices, a little bit. let it out for a couple of days. It should be hard, stale, because you want it to soak up all that goodness. So, yeah. You know, I think some of the, you know, when you're doing keto duplicates, dupes, copycats, whatever, sometimes you have to, you know, take a few extra steps to make it really worthwhile because yeah. keto bread's a little bit like... um rubbery sometimes sort of chew kind of gummy or something can get yeah, yeah it's a little yeah yeah, yeah. because yeah. The, because in order to get that bready glutinousness without gluten yeah. you need to add other sticky things uh-huh. yeah um, yeah because for me the beauty of stuffing is is that sort of almost bread puddingy quality where exactly. it like reconnects. yeah it's hard 100%. it's harder and yeah, but I think you're right that sausage can be very helpful because it gives you a 100%. little bit of that mouthfeel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I think my biggest learning doing keto recipes was get to the core of what you're looking for, like elementally. Don't be like, I want exactly this food and I'm going to duplicate it. But what do you love about your favorite food that you mm-hmm. want to bring in? What's the underlying experience you're looking right. to have? Right, right, right. And maybe that's kind of like what I was saying before, like, you know, no cauliflower mash is going to make me trick me that I'm not eating, you know, like, so so what are you really looking for when you want mashed potatoes? And is there another way to get that? Maybe that is cauliflower mash. Maybe it's garlic. Maybe it's butter. Maybe there's other parts of it. But I, I totally see what you're saying. And that's why sometimes like, you know, one of the things that I have discovered is that there really isn't, and this is me, I'm not saying that everybody needs to feel this way, but there, to me, there's no true pasta. That uh, I, it, uh-huh. <laughs> you're right. I, and again, don't blame me, <laughs> but I have not in four years ever sat down to a bowl of a keto version of pasta, whatever that is palmini doesn't matter that makes me think i'm sitting in an italian restaurant it just to me doesn't do that and so honestly i just don't eat a lot of pasta anymore i'm fine with a i'll make that it's so funny last night i made um bolognese for dinner and like mm-hmm. literally just ate a bowl of it i just i don't, oh, I don't even worry about the pasta because of what you meat. just said yeah. that's what made me think of this is is because of what you just said was it really the pasta i was looking for or was it the sauce? So I could just eat a bowl of of bolognese and I feel like I'm missing nothing. But literally, it's, it's bolognese. It's bolognese. so good to me. I'll put a little <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. that's a I should use that. I put a little dollop of whole milk ricotta on top and I'm Calibro in heaven, you know. It's the best ricotta, I'm just gonna say. I don't know if you've ever tried cal have you ever tried Calibro brand ricotta? I don't think so. I will send you a link to it because it is Please. so good. So good. Oh my God. Now I'm really intrigued. All right. It's yeah, like the that best. sounds anyway, amazing. I like miracle noodles. I like shirataki pasta, but it's its own thing. It is its own thing to me. It yep. reminds me more of ramen. Yeah. It's not wheat pasta, but you have to love no, it for what it is. Or it's oh, not. no, no. I use shirataki for pad thai, for pho. Completely works. The pad thai, nobody will know my pad thai recipe. Yeah. Like again, there are times and places, but but I will not put it under bolognese. A little weird sauce. under it's bolognese, just, yeah. A little weird. For me. Okay, so I have a total departure, but I also don't want to take too much of your time, which is Yes. Do you ever feel pressure in the influencer community, you know, whatever you want to call it, that you're representing keto to be smaller? Um, wow and this is not about you in any way may i say i think no 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 i didn't take it that way thank you i feel that (laughs) and so i Um, just want to talk about it yeah so what a really important question um thank you for asking i i only took that as as a great question short answer yes long answer absolutely yes um but i don't to clarify, I don't feel pressure from other people. It's yeah. me. 
Yeah. Um, it's my own insecurities. It's my own, my own crap, to be honest. Like, I, I don't know if losing weight, I would magically feel better about my body more than I, you know, like I still don't love what I see in the mirror. And as somebody who's now done decent amount of television work, <laughs> this is something that I am faced with, uh, mm, literally, yeah. uh, front and center. Oh, that angle. Oh, I don't like, the, uh, like I have had to really face what my body looks like with clothes. And then at home, you know, like when you lose weight, you things hang and sag and things do things that you don't love. And so, you know, I don't know that that will ever go away from me. I could maybe lose another 80 pounds and probably still give you the same answer. So what I'm trying to say is I feel that pressure every day from me. I don't particularly feel that way because I'm an quote unquote influencer because I'm whatever. I also want to just drop in here and, you know, maybe I'm saying this out of line as a man, it shouldn't be my place to say this, but I think it must be harder for women in my mind who are in this, this space, this diet space. Um, I just saw another influencer post some screenshots of somebody, another woman who left her some really nasty comments and she screenshotted it and shared it. And, you know, I, I've seen quite a bit of that and, I don't feel as that doesn't happen to me mm -hmm. as a man. I don't know if it's because I'm a man or women seeing other women that they connect with or don't connect with and feel the need to show. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say right now. Yeah, I hear you. I, I don't get those comments and, mm -hmm. and I think it's gotta be a hard world out there for, for women in general, but especially in, in the sense where people are looking at their bodies um, sure. as part of their job. But uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I, I definitely feel it. I definitely have my own demons and battle with body image and self-esteem and insecurity on a daily basis because of my work on television and social media for sure. But I also recognize that it's probably me more than anyone. And no, like, I don't think I'm at my skinniest right now, but also my body's been changing a lot lately, which is something that I'm getting. I saw used you've to. been working out a lot this year. Yes. You're, you're paying attention. <laughs> um, so I lost all my weight without ever going to a gym originally in the last year or just over a year, July of last year, July of 2021, I stepped into a gym for the first time and like basically since high school, college. And I've been on this fitness journey now. So I'm kind of bulking up. So on one hand, I see my body bigger actually than it used to be, but it's different, bigger. It's different. And some of the clothes that a year ago might've been loose are now starting to fit a little tight on my chest, but then my face still. So it's like, I'm, I'm always, you know, I that. totally hear you that like experience of just being a smaller, not being your primary mm. goal all the time is very challenging when you've lived in a big mm. body. Yeah. 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 yeah kind of being okay with that. And, yeah. you know, again, I was well over 300 pounds. So yeah. even losing 80 pounds, I'm still yeah. to something, you know, like I'm still a big guy. And so now that I'm adding muscle to that muscle underneath of still a few curves and edges, some days I like what I see and some days I don't. And so I, I think that's something that I'll stay battling with, but um, I really love that I'm, honoring this next chapter of my my health journey that isn't about losing weight but is also just about physical fitness and strength and i've loved this new part of my life where I, where i do exercise and it makes me feel stronger and happier and that to me is more important than noticing a little bit of you know but but it's like oh i have little things here or whatever that i didn't have before or, either, yeah and again so. i was thinking that when i watch the like when i watch myself on video mm. when i'm not like dead on you know yeah. i'm like oh oh no that angle is a oh, no it's tough. Yeah, yeah that would be very hard for me to be on a tv show where i i couldn't control mm. that yeah yeah social media and stuff you can kind of curate yeah <laughs> the edit yourself tv not so much and then as they say uh, television adds 10 pounds. I don't know if that's really true, um, but th yeah, it's a very vulnerable it, topic for me. So it, uh, yeah, thank you for talking I, I, I about it with me. I appreciate that you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, 
I think it's important. Like the last week I had this thought, which is like, you can hate yourself thin, but you'll hate yourself thin. If you don't do the work on the way, you're going to hate yourself when you get there. Right. And it's like, but even when you lose the weight, you're like, Oh, I'm still me. I'm still in here. This brain that sees myself this way is still in here. This journey of self-love is, is not for weaklings. No, (laughs) no, it's hard. And I think that's why it's really important for people who do want to lose weight to dig in deep and, and try not to go into it because you hate your body or because you're not happy with the mirror, but maybe go into it because you want to really honor yourself kind of as like a self care thing rather than a, I look so bad, ugly, fat, any of those negative words, trying to get rid of that language. I think that's really important because, you know, then what happens is you lose 20 pounds, which is a huge accomplishment, but you don't see those 20 pounds the way you think you're going to. And then you don't feel good about it. And losing five pounds or 20 pounds is an amazing accomplishment. I think that gets lost a little bit when you're seeing, you know, and, and this is why like for, for me personally, very rarely do I ever post like before or afters, you know, I'm open about my journey, but I don't think for me the before and after is the point. Um, I feel like when often when we post, even myself included, when I mm. post a before and after, although I call it a before and during, right, is like um, you're justifying that you're better, that you're that you're improved. Like you're like, oh, I know you don't think I'm thin enough yet because that's the thought mm. in my head. Right. But look where I came from. Mm. Um, like it's it's a justification sometimes. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah. And I, you know, I. I don't think I've built my brand particularly around weight loss. I, I don't think, think you have either. No. And that's okay for people. I'm not saying that's yeah. anything good or bad. I just think yeah. for me is again, yeah. I am here as a chef to try to help people yeah. eat good food. I, you know, um, if you lose weight on it, that's great. If you don't, that's fine too. You know, I think there's resources for that specifically that I'm not really the most capable of, of dealing I with. Think, I think there's a group of people who are like, I have to lose 20 pounds. I'm going to go keto. I don't think that's like the core audience that you speak to or that I speak to or that listen to this podcast, honestly. I think a lot of the people that really are the like true keto folk are like, I Mm. was going to die and I now am not. Like not as soon anyway. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah. And and there's no, like, I think I want to put like a big parentheses around this yeah. just to say like, there is no, that doesn't mean we're right or there, like none of that is right or wrong or better or worse. It's really, I think it's about finding your tribe. I mean, there's a huge group around the country or the world that are like the fitness buffs, you know, yeah. who are keto, you know, keto bodybuilders. And then there's keto that are really more of like the sciencey side of keto and i think the like biohackers yeah the biohackers and 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 then there's sort of the weight loss and then there's the yada 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 and i think you know finding and connecting with your goals your tribe in this space is important i do think just to tie into the the question about social media from the influencer, but I think also from the consumer end, because I still consume right. other people. We are we do not on, only on exist media. as influencer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there were even for me, and I think everyone probably relate to this, but there's probably some people who uh don't help you and it's okay to mute them or unfollow them to create distance from social media when it's not helping you and to be honest about that and create healthy boundaries for yourself whatever that means if there's a person that is getting in your head or you're like why don't i look like her or him or why how are they losing five pounds in one month and i have lost two i'm a failure i'm not doing this right what am i doing wrong i get that question a lot wait i've done x y and z and i've only lost two pounds this and invariably they give you a number where you're like you're doing excellent i know i'm like jesus two pounds in a month is phenomenal so yeah yeah i think i think finding curate your space right curate your space yeah and, and create boundaries when you need to I would say the same thing as an influencer. I don't, I'm not trying to be 
there's no way that everyone's going to like my content. You know, there's definitely, there's always going to be people who feel, or who will comment, you know, oh, that dinner has 12 net carbs. That's not keto. And I'm like, well, then don't make that. One. Um, that yeah. Then, then don't you. make that one. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but also for me, a 12 net carb dinner is phenomenal, especially since yeah. I don't really eat breakfast or lunch. Like, right. it, you know, that, that's phenomenal for me you know, understanding that there's a lot of different approaches, a lot of different way to track food and count carbs and da, 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 da. I think it's just really important to kind of understand all this stuff, which also is why keto can be right. confusing for some people too, because there's a lot of information out there. I think to circle back, when I started keto, there was like one cookbook. There was like one book, one mm. cookbook. And now there are so many <laughs> cookbooks and things. I think cookbooks are really helpful, especially when you're new to keto, because what are the videos people want me to make? It's like what I eat in a day. People apparently have no idea how to put a meal together, what to eat, how to eat, macros, throw them into a tizzy. So I think cookbooks can be super helpful, especially when they are realistic cookbooks, right? Mm. We all have our fantasy cookbooks, like the holiday cookbooks are supposed to be a little bit fantastical, but you have a new cookbook coming out soon that I think will be a great source in this arena. And it's called New Keto. Why is it called New Keto? Because I feel like I'm taking a new approach to keto. Okay. Um, all three of my books, I've it's sort of my series, you know. Give I us a directory if you feel are, like it. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think it's an important conversation. You know, I think yeah. that keto has a PR problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that a lot of people go into a Barnes and Noble or Amazon and they they see all these keto books that are promising, you know, results or um, 28 pounds in 28 uh, days. And you're like, Arr. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I'm trying to much like many ways of this conversation kind of say that like I'm a different kind of keto. You know, I'm trying to build keto food that is, uh, it can be used as diet food, certainly, but it's really not designed for weight loss. It is designed for sustainability. It is designed for practicality. And honestly, more than anything, it's just designed to be really tasty first. Like if I can get it to the point of tastiness, then I'll kind of figure out if um, if I need to tone back on one vegetable to correct the macros or whatever. But this is a keto that is designed for people who want to stay keto. Mm. And that to me is a new approach. Mm. Um, I think most of the keto work out there is great for the, I need to lose 20 pounds to get in my bikini and that's fine. I don't know if I would suggest my book for that though. Because it's it's real hearty comfort food. You know, I don't make up ridiculous small portion sizes so that it fits the macros. And like, this is real stuff. This is stuff that's really designed to feed your whole family. You know, and my whole thing about keto is like, I cannot stand how people say that it's like unhealthy or unsustainable or dangerous. And like the keto food that is in my books is real food. You should and could feed it to your whole family, even people who aren't keto, even people who aren't losing weight. So I know it's a long winded response to the first part of your question, but to me, this is a new conversation around keto, around what does keto look like outside of the weight loss space? And what does it look like for people who want to build a lifestyle around keto where this is just the food we eat, not because we have a particular diet goal, but because it's just really good and it makes me feel good and it makes my family feel good. So that that's sort of where this this new thing comes from is I just I'm just trying to draw a line where I just do things a little different. You could feed the whole cookbook to I mean, don't feed the cookbook literally, but feed the food in the cookbook to somebody. And they wouldn't be like, oh, is this a keto recipe? They'd just be like, this is good. Yeah, that's, yeah. Li that's literally like the point. Right. Um, and in fact, most of the, like when I have people test my recipes, I have non-keto people test them, yeah. like my mom and, and friends and stuff. Because if I can get a non-keto person to eat my food, to me, that's like, 
the grand prize. Right. Because I give my <laughs> mom sometimes some like keto bread recipe I'm trying out that I'm like, this is pretty good. She literally will just open her mouth, let the bread like fall out. Like oh, it's just I know. It's like, uh, uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't do that. Like that's just right. not what my version of keto is. Right. And again, you'll my books don't have a lot of that like dupes. Yeah. They're just you know, a beautiful sheet pan meal with chicken and olives and feta cheese or whatever, oh, you know, like so really, good. yeah, just olives, like, so food, underrated. you know, yeah. So underrated. I know. And a lot of people think they don't like them because they've only had like the canned things from pizza when they were a kid. Good olives are oh, one of the greats. So, but the book anyway, is called I, I new keto dinner in 30. So I want to highlight yeah. that both of those things are important. We talked about the new keto but I mean, I don't think we have to spend much time on why getting dinner together in 30 minutes is important. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But how do you do that? How do I make this quick? How do I make it not take forever? And you solve that problem. Yeah, you know, simple, 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 simple. And and I mean that in the best way. Like, I, I do think that even as a recipe developer, I think it's funny sometimes when you open a recipe and it's like two pages long, you know, with steps and, th- and I'm like, even for me, I'm like, I would never do that on a Tuesday. I just, I wouldn't, I, you know, if I opened a cookbook and it went on to the second page, I'd be like, I'm out of here. No way. Just I'll ground up some beef and throw some, a jar of tomato sauce in it before I do that, you know, which is fine too. But that's kind of what I'm trying to say here is like, you know, you can actually make some really, really delicious food. And I also look at my recipes as as ideas. Yes, you can follow word for word. Like a jumping and, off and you, point, right? Yeah, you, you can follow word for word. But if you don't like chicken thighs, then use salmon. If you don't like salmon, just take the sauce and throw it on the steak. Like every, I think my 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 recipes, in addition to sort of being, um, you know, very straightforward recipes with like, I think most of the instructions in this book are a paragraph that's about that mm. thick in the book, you know, mm. like two inches. It's also like, it's a lesson. You know, every single recipe on every page has a pro tip on how you can either learn something new in the kitchen or create a different version of it with like one extra ingredient, you know, whatever. I don't know what we were talking about with the Greek thing. You know, maybe you use Calabrian chili from a jar from Trader Joe's or something. Like I'll give like something cool, a twist, an option, a culinary skill something on every recipe. So I really look at my books, not just as like a recipe, but also kind of a way that you can learn. And next time you don't have to even read the paragraph because you kind of just know that's my, my goal. Cause I feel like, I mean, it's been a thread through our whole talk that you've been sort of saying essentially like keto is a language, right? Like cooking has Mm, languages and like sometimes you're speaking Italian and sometimes you're speaking French, but like keto has its own language. You can't just bake keto foods by changing the sweetener right but if you learn how to like properly season and cook a chicken well now you've got all sorts of options and your book it sounds like walks you through that language right Right. yeah no 100 percent. i've never thought of it though but i love that yeah and it's a language that i think you and i sound like we we already speak and we've discovered some similar little things over the years that are almost identical because Food is a universal language if you just kind of figure out the right way to communicate and the right way to connect to it. And I think, you know, for me, that's just all I want to share with people is just just like this is a way that you can really eat delicious food um, without having to sacrifice. That's it. Take us through. You have three cookbooks now. Well, once this one comes out, tell me your cookbooks and like just give me like the highlight, like who would want it? Why? What What do you love yeah. about it? So that if people are like, well, I'm yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, this. love this. OK, first book, New Keto Cooking, <laughs> straightforward. That is really for the foodies. That one is really oh my God, my cat. Scratch- Can you hear that? My cat's scratching. No, it's okay. The door. It's OK. She's hungry. <laughs> I have cats. I have uh, apparently this is this is not a very professional recording right now. Welcome um, to my podcast. Welcome to our yeah our show. Um, <laughs> uh, new keto cooking first book is really for the foodies who you know date night dinner parties. You want to show how sexy and chefy keto food can be. That is your book. Do not go there if you're brand new to keto. 
although all my recipes are cookable, like they're all fine, but there's like a whole date night chapter in there with like mm-hmm. filet mignon and really beautiful chefy twists on how to cook keto. So if you really want, if you're bored of keto and you're bored of all the same old, same old stuff you see in every blog and every cookbook, number one, new keto cooking. It's really different. Just a different kind of cookbook. I shot it. looks almost like, um, like a food and wine magazine, very elegant photos. It's very elegant. Book number two went the opposite end of the spectrum with a comfort food book. So that one is new keto comfort cooking. And that one is obviously just yummy family style, nothing fancy, you know, crock pots and baking sheets and comfort food. Need I say more? And then the third book is really for practical day-to-day keto cooking for your family, 30 minutes or less. It's a Tuesday night. It's a Wednesday night. I got to get food on the table. This is your book. I don't have to special order anything for this recipe. No, everything is super, super, super simple. Common grocery store ingredients. Even the desserts are, you know, like mug cakes and easy things that you can make in five minutes. Um, But still, it's still chef. It's still me. You know, all the books are still me. So it's still, I got, I got to get this cat. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We have a cat joining us now. All right. Hey, cat. (laughs) <laughs> so uh 30 minute dinners yeah i mean i think that's kind of truthfully because that's where i'm at in my life of like i am so busy i have to like some nights like what do i i don't know what to do i don't you know everybody kind of has their staples i don't know what to do i just need to get food on the table that's what this book really is about is really super simple yummy food in, in a half hour um and most of it actually is less than that a lot of them i do this thing in the book where i have like the active cooking time as mm-hmm. well as the total right because some of them are like five minutes of work like you just throw things on a sheet tray the other 25 minutes are just sitting in the oven so five oh, minutes so it's of 30 minutes cooking. done like food yes on the table not oh yeah. yeah yeah 30 minutes done and uh and some of them are much less in actual yeah. work so yeah. you know and there's like, sometimes you a, buy a, a thirty minute cookbook, and they're like the thirty active minutes, and you're like, wait, yeah, like thir- thirty minutes of putting things in the crock pot, and then your dinner's ready in six hours. Yeah, no, I don't do. No, that's not in this book. <laughs> no, this is food on the table in thirty minutes. Yeah, nice. even desserts. Nice. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. I know, I know. We have to cut it off because we could probably end up doing this. We could just day. keep chatting, right? So yeah. before we close, though, two things. How do people learn Mm. more about you? When can they get this new book? The first two are already out. You can get them. And then the third is like, what do you want to leave people with? Okay. Easiest place to find me, obviously, is social media um, on Instagram at Chef Michael Keto. And then my YouTube and TikTok are up and coming. I'm having so much fun with them. And I post some different stuff than I do on social media, on Instagram. Instagram is really like my, my home base with the full recipes and the pretty stuff. YouTube and TikTok is a little bit more of my like personality, you know, a little bit sillier da- daily stuff going on in my life. Um, so I encourage you to check out my YouTube or TikTok. We'll put links in. Chef Michael. Yeah, just Chef Michael on both of those. My blog, chefmichael.com. There's a hyphen in there, chef-michael.com. Tons of recipes, resources, even the kitchen tools I suggest, all kinds of stuff on the blog even travel guides. I'm working, I'm doing all kinds of things. I'm just having fun with it. So uh, chefmichael.com. And then um, all my cookbooks are, all of them are available on almost anywhere you could get your books, Barnes and Noble, Target, Walmart, whatever. Amazon, of course, support local. If you can, any local bookstore will be able to get you my book international. There's free shipping worldwide at bookdepository.com. And then this new book comes out October 25th, so a couple of weeks away. Pre-order it now, and you do get my new slow cooker ebook for free. I sound like a commercial. Pre-order now and get my slow <laughs> cooker ebook for do free. Do I get a, a set gift. of Ginsu knives with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man. Um, I know. But yes, if you pre-order only, which means you have to do this before October 25th, you do get a free ebook as a gift for supporting the launch. Pre-order is super important for authors. It costs you the same, but it means that the book arrives at your door on publish day. So you'll get the first copy of the book on the day it publishes. And then you also get a free little ebook as well. So nice. That good, good to know. Okay, oh, what do awesome. I want to leave people with? And what do you what want to leave people, people with? with? The only way you are eating wrong is if you are not enjoying what you're eating. 
All right. I, I think like that's it. important to remember. Do not give up joy around food for the sake of health. Find a way to do both. That's the trick to making it last. Find a way to yeah. do both. You can you can get healthier, whatever that means for you, with food you actually enjoy eating. Don't don't suffer your way through a diet or it'll last a week or a month and then nothing, you know. Yeah, yeah, I love that, this. Yeah. I love that. I think it's really important. I think because I think there are different types of people. I think some people are like, I can only eat meat. And if I eat anything, then just meat, everything goes to hell. And I'm like, I support you. But there's I think there's a lot more people who are like, how do I enjoy all this? And how do I have I love food. I don't want to have to divorce that from my life to be healthy. And you don't have you really don't yeah. have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you really right. don't have to. So Happy awesome. eating. That's what happy that's eating, what everybody. I always like. To t- that's when I sign my cookbooks. I always write happy eating or happy cooking because that's what it's all about. So good. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sorry we went a little bit over, but it was such a good conversation. I appreciate you. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Keto Life Support. Want more information? Want show notes? Want to suggest a topic? Just head over to ketolifesupport.com. That's where all that kind of thing can go on. By the way, I have a request. If you could go to your podcast host and hit subscribe, we would really, really appreciate it. And what would be even more awesome is if you could write a review. And what would be even more awesome than that is if you could write like a really flattering review. Just asking, you know, you do you. All right. So thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled that you're part